to walk with God. One. This has a, uh, if you get into the menu on that, it's got a 60-page manual on it. You can print off on your computer. And uh, to walk with God. And that lays a foundation. To walk with God. And then there's to walk with God too on a DVD. They're 25-minute slots because it was made for TV. Uh, and so you have to put up with that. It's 25-minute slots, okay? But the Gospel of the Kingdom, I'd really recommend that, you know? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine messages. These are all in MP3 format. If you haven't got an MP3 format, get one. It's the future. It's the now, you know? Get an MP3 player. Some of your DVD players will play MP3, you know? Understanding Grace. I really recommend that. And Destiny. Destiny. And finally, there's a lot of others here, but the Epistles of John. Really, really that is one you should get. John had a real understanding of how to walk with God. And... and, uh, he lays it out for us, and I would really recommend them to you. So, there's a few there to keep you going. Okay. Praise God. <laughs> I can only see as far as the, cam- uh, the camera here. <laughs> Praise God. Well, the last night, hey. I want to thank you for all your kindness and love. And I would really appreciate it. It's been great you know, to be with you. Praise God. America, America. Hmm. You know, your opportunity is right on the doorstep. It's coming up, you know. America. For days and days before I came out here, the Lord gave me this, America, America. They're just the tune, you know. And I couldn't figure out what it was. Until, and my wife was singing the tune. We both couldn't figure out what it was. Until I looked it up on the net. It was your destiny. And the angel that came to me the other night said, I inspired this to be written and sung through the years all over this nation. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruitful plain. America, America, God shed his grace on you and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stern in passion stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend your every floor. Confirm your soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. A lot of soldiers fighting in Iraq tonight and dying in Iraq. O beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness, and every gain divine. And then he goes on down to the ends of the age, into the millennium reign of Christ, and he says, O beautiful, a patriot dream, that sees beyond the years, your alabaster cities will gleam, undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. It's your destiny. It's your destiny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to talk tonight about destiny. Some of you will have heard some of this, some of you won't. I'm just going to mix it. This as the Lord gives to me tonight. And, uh, oh, hallelujah. 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 Mm. 
church in heaven and the army in heaven drawing close to the army are on earth hallelujah great battle going on over this nation in the realm of the spirit you know there's all kinds of we talk about Iraq your forces in Iraq and we've got troops in Iraq and Britain's got troops in Iraq you know there is a bond in the spirit which is, is, which will, is eternal with America, Australia and the United Kingdom and there is an eternal bond and we've got to get beyond the politics you know of Iraq that's really not what it's about sure there's the issue of oil sure there's the issue that America needs a base in the Middle East and Iraq would be great for that but when you get beyond that you know we've got to the politics leave that the battle is really over conflict between the kingdom of God and the spirit of Babylon and that's what we have to see the spirit of Babylon old Babylon was in Iraq and there's a battle between those spirits and we've got to let the politics go because there is a greater battle going on here and there's greater things at stake and we've got to be mature, be mature enough to see beyond that and you've got to pray and constantly constantly pray for your troops you know and uh, we just lost one of our guys in Afghanistan the other day and uh, you know there are battles on many fronts but primarily it is spiritual and we need to be mature enough to see that and understand that because the God we're in the process globally of working our destinies now and how these things fall will affect us all and so we really just you know need to be aware of that you know God is positioning people on both sides heaven and in earth and uh, you know in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15 let me just read that to you Ephesians 3 and 15 um, it reads like this it reads uh, let's see of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth are named that's one family in whom the whole family in heaven and in earth are named see it doesn't separate the whole church in heaven and earth are the same church you know and we, we kind of need to begin you know to understand that because heaven is drawn close to earth and the veil is becoming thin God said Daniel would stand on the earth in the latter days. You say, well, that is figurative. No, it isn't. Moses and Elijah are going to stand on this earth while the church is still here. In the latter days. The Bible is very clear. We, you know, very clear of that. And the church in heaven and the church on earth are drawing close together. And... Uh, Hallelujah. You know, God is taking some people home because he needs them on the other side. And usually it's young people. And you say, why do good young people die? Because God needs them on the other side. He's forming an army on the other side to work with the army on this side. And there's a great repositioning going on. Uh, and we need to be, understand that because more and more of this is going to take place in the days that lie ahead. And we need to understand what it is about. Some of you have lost children. And you say, why, Lord? Why, Lord? Why? You know, God needs them. But both the church in heaven and the army in heaven and the church in earth uh, working together and God is beginning to reposition people for this final run this final conflict this final great harvest hallelujah many of you know the story of my daughter who died you know she uh, and it was a great shock to us but you know she came to me one Sunday morning after service and said that I really need to go and, and I've got some backslidden um, friends who were brought up with me and I really need to go to that nation and witness to them. I really feel on my heart I need to go and talk to them. And I said, that's okay, you go. And uh, 
I gave her a hug and off she went and she brought them all to the Lord. You know? But before that, she gave me a little envelope and she said, if I'm late in getting back, just don't open this unless I'm late in getting back. And I never thought too much about it. I thought, oh, okay, you know. But she didn't come home. You see, she died in a car accident. And just before she left, she said to me, she said, Dad, all the prophecy over my life has been fulfilled. There's none left. It's all fulfilled. And that made me a little uneasy, but um, I was wanting to prophesy over her. But, you know, so when she didn't come home, I opened this letter. And it was the funeral service, what was to be sung, what hymns, the order, who was to take it, and it was signed, Seed. And um, destiny. God is repositioning people. You know? Destiny. Hallelujah. No, oh, these are exciting days in which we live. There's only one family, you know. Glory to God. I want to talk to you just a little bit about this, this destiny. Before I go on to that, let me share a, a, an account with, with which I had. I was praying one day, and I was caught up in the Spirit, and I found myself riding with the army of the Lord. I was on a white horse. The Lord Jesus was on a white horse. There was a lot of young people, mostly. Some of them as young as, you know, 10, 12, but a lot around the age of 15 through to 20, 25, which it seemed to me. I'm not good at guessing ages, but... <laughs> They were there, and they were so excited, and they were marching in the army of the Lord, and they were coming upon an Islamic city. And uh, as we got close to this Islamic city, I say close, maybe oh, no, a few hundred meters away from, from, from the city, I heard the sound of automatic, you know, that sound of automatic weapons fire. And everybody pulled up, stopped, just stopped. And I thought, you know, oh, no, you know, what's going to happen? And I could hear this in the background, this automatic weapon fire, and I thought, oh, we're going to have a problem in this city. Then I heard these young people crowding around the Lord saying, let me go and be a martyr. Let me go. Let me die for this city. And another one said, no, 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 I want to go. And this went on for ages, and I thought, these kids are crazy, you know. What are they doing? And finally, the Lord looked down at a girl, about 19, and he said, you can go. And that girl was so happy. And she began to sing. And this whole army had stopped, but she started to walk down that road. And when she got closer in, you could hear the sound of automatic weapon fire again, that everything went in slow motion. I mean, everything just went... You know how it goes into slow motion? She was in slow motion still singing, and I saw a, a, just a cluster of bullets coming towards this girl. And I thought, oh no, I wonder if I could reach her and pull her out of there. All this stuff was running through my mind. And I kept looking at the Lord, keep, you know, and he was resolute, he just looked. And as this, this, this began to close on her, she's walking forward and this was closing, when that group of bullets got about this close to her, her spirit came out of her body. Just whoosh, These bullets took her body down. And, but when that happened, there was a flash of light at ground level that came out. And it came out at such a speed and it engulfed that city. Just light. I mean, just... You know how sometimes an atomic explosion goes and then it goes at ground level? great speed but it was light and then I, I had a view of inside of the city and I could see these people the city, very large city people and then I could see scales falling off their eyes when the light went over them just scales fall off their eyes and then they could see Jesus and they knew who he was 
And Jesus just said, forward. And the whole army went into that city. I turned as that army, that army just started to move off. I turned to look and there was a girl on a white horse. And it was my daughter. And she looked at me and just winked. <laughs> and I heard her say, I told you I'd still be working with you. God's got a battle plan, I tell you. Your sons and your daughters. Hallelujah. You're going to pour out your spirit, his spirit on your sons and your daughters. Oh, it's exciting, you know. God's got a plan for the harvest. That whole city fell to the Lord. Not in judgment, but in mercy and love. Because one girl... And that girl immediately was on another white horse riding with us in the, into the city. And she was so radiant and light. No wonder they were saying, let me go, let me go, let me go. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. First Corinthians 2.9, you know, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God is revealing them to us by his spirit. These are the days when God's revealing stuff to us by his spirit like never before. And uh, we're beginning to get understanding of things like never before, you know? 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us, who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, listen, which was given to you in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, no matter how you read that, it still means the same thing. You can't spiritualize it. God saved you, that he called you with a holy calling, not according to our own design, not our works, but according to his purpose and grace. And this was given to you in Christ Jesus before this world was even formed. I want you to meditate on that. Think about it. Who are we? See, this generation, this generation of young people need to know where they came from, why they are here, and where they are going. You know, the, 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 the evolution is beginning to run its course now. It really is. And I think it was John Paul, a guy called John Paul Sartre in the 70s, professor. He went through many universities teaching on evolution. And uh, all the kids in these universities said, oh, well, if that's where we came from, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And kind of lawlessness erupted on campuses, university campuses all over the world. You remember that in the 70s? It's changing now. People realize that there was something wrong with that. And we're getting lots of kind of movies that, that are looking at uh, we have a spirit. Now, you know, there are lots of movies out there depicting that now. I mean, and the graphics are really good, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> but if you have a spirit, that couldn't evolve. Where did that come from? You see, God is subtly getting the message across. This generation needs to know where they've come from, who they are, and what's the future. And the Lord said to me clearly, you need to give this generation of young people something to die for. If you don't, another cause will. And they'll be willing to die for it. You know? Most young people, if you told them what kind of world we would have very shortly, they'd die for it. They'd be willing to give their lives for it. 
They'd say, yeah, we want this. We're sick of this planet. We're sick of what's going on on the planet. Give them something to die for. There is a new world coming. There is a utopia out there. There is something very, very different, and it's worth dying for. And countless thousands of young people will be willing to die for it called you with a holy calling. You know, Psalm 8 and verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels. That word angels, the translators couldn't handle the Hebrew, and they translated it angels, but it's the, it's the word for God, Elohim. Made us a little lower than Elohim. A little lower than God. We are children of God. And uh, crowned him with glory and honor made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. What is man, you see? Who are we? Where did we come from? You know, that question's been asked by sages and philosophers, for theologians, for generations. Who are we? We live on a planet spinning in infinite space. What is it all about? What's the meaning of the universe? Why are there so many planets, thousands upon thousands of galaxies? What is it about? God has a plan. Hallelujah. Oh, I tell you. You know, right now on planet Earth, we are learning primarily, primarily, our lesson is to learn to become love under every condition. If you get that right, you get a lot of things right. You see? And this is, we're, in a, we're in a schoolhouse. We're in a university of training. And we only get one shot at this. You're right? It's on this planet. And God decided that planet Earth was just hard enough. It had the right conditions to produce sons of God. <laughs> so here we are. And we say, well, glory to God, the millennium's coming, Jesus is coming back. That's true, and it's fantastic. But once we get into the, the millennium, it's still another training ground to learning to rule and reign and administer his kingdom under him. It's not the end, it's just the beginning, you know. And when we get to the end of the millennium, and a thousand years will go like that, and we'll have access to heaven as well as earth continually. And I tell you, we get to the end of that millennium reign and our training is finished there. The new Jerusalem, heaven comes down upon the earth. This earth, earth is renovated by fire. It becomes more spiritual than we've ever known it before. And it becomes the capital of the universe from which God will extend his kingdom. And without end, the Bible says, the extension of his kingdom will know no end. Star Trek will have nothing on it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, where is the pull on your life? Where are your dreams, you know? Where, what really grabs your attention? What makes you come alive? when something touches your destiny. Amen. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You come along. Yeah. Hallelujah. We are children of God. Made in his image and likeness. We're like him. We look like him. Got arms, a head, feet. We've got some amazing characteristics. His DNA is in us. We are children of God. Only species in the universe like this. Incredible, you know, angels are not like this. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys, but... We have a spirit. We are essentially a spirit. First Corinthians 2.11 For who knoweth the things of man save the spirit which is in him? That's our spirit. Ecclesiastes 3.21 Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upwards? You see? We are essentially spirit. And the question needs to ask, we need to ask is, where did our spirit come from? You know? When did it come into existence? 
Was your spirit created the day you were conceived? You know, we were always taught that. It never sat with me that. You know, we need to look at some scriptures. Timothy, you know, saved us, called us with a holy calling before the world began, right? This tells us that you and I were given a commission by God in heaven long before this planet was created. You agreed to accept that commission. It was agreed in what time period you would come to this earth and what your role would be. And you said, yes, you agreed. You had a choice. Hallelujah. <laughs> My wife often says to me, boy, if I knew it was going to be harder like this, I would not know if I would have chosen it. <laughs> I said, Lord, he said, Lord, you didn't tell us what it would be like on this planet. But nevertheless, <laughs> one day I was in prayer under great pressure. I mean, God put me under pressure, which lasted all about mm, 16 months. Real, real pressure. Never known pressure like it. And uh, I thought, oh, man, I just wanted to give up everything. You know? And, uh, and, and, and one day I had a visitation from someone who'd been under similar pressure. <laughs> and uh, this man came to me in the spirit and he said, I need to talk to you. I'm going to share a little about that tonight. You know, in the first 37 chapters of the book of Job, Job is complaining that he was ever born. Now you've got to understand, this guy is a great guy. He said, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. Perfect man. I wouldn't mind God saying that about me. Either. Perfect man. Don't get down on Job. All right, he did a good job of getting through what he went through. He really did. And when he came out of that experience, twice as much as he started with. But all God was saying, this is my son, Job. What do you think of him? It's my servant, Job. The devil said, oh, yeah, but if you didn't supply everything he needs, if you didn't bless him, he wouldn't serve you. He only serves you because of what you give him. God looked at Job and said, no, I can trust him. He said, okay, you can do anything you like to him except kill him. That wasn't so good, but you know the story. You know, and uh, Job went through that terrible experience. We have no idea really what Job went through. You know, he was covered from head to toe in boils and he was scraping them off. Not only that, his three friends didn't help him. They were saying, you've sinned, you've done this, you've done that, you must have done something wrong. Isn't it funny when Christians go through bad times, quite often other Christians say, oh, you must have sinned, you must have... <laughs> Come on. Come on, man. It's not the way it is. They lo lost their house in the fire. Whoa, they must have done something wrong. For crying out loud, it's not like that. You know? Oh, hallelujah. So he goes on for, you know, 38 chapters. He said, let the day perish wherein I was born in chapter 3, and the night which it was said there is a man child conceived. He said, oh, for, let me die. I don't want this. And so for all those chapters, he goes on and on and on and on. And you know the story until we get right down to chapter 38. And then God said, I've had enough. Okay, Job's had enough. We've all had enough. He said, right. <laughs> then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? No. Gird up your loins like a man. I want some answers out of you. Man, if God came into your room and said that to you, you know, 
you think, woo, woo, woo. He said, now listen to me, Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof? If you know the measures and distance of the earth, do you know anything about the earth? It's very interesting in the book of Job. Job talks about some of the uh, star systems, Orion and others. How did he know that? He said, where were you when we made the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, where were you, Job? See, he's defining the period. When all the morning stars sang together, sons of God shouted for joy. You know, it says, tells in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 that we shall become as the stars, shine forever. But he said, where were you? And it goes on, we won't read it all. When we, you know, gave the tide, the oceans, where their limits, it goes to the whole of creation. When we formed all this and decided upon it, how the earth would look like and what it was all about, where were you? Declare it. Then verse 21 says, Knowest thou it because you were born? Or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered into the treasures of the snow? Do you know all about the snow and the treasures of the hail which we created? You know, when I went through Bible school, I was taught that God was now mocking Job. Yeah, where were you when we did all all that? However you know, God doesn't mock his children. It didn't sit well with me. I thought, boy, it doesn't sound like God to me. You know, in this visitation, I said, I'll tell you where I was. You know, the amplified version of verse 21 here says, no, it said, when it says in the King James, knowest thou that you knowest it because you were born then? Not saying that. The amplified version says, you know all these things because you were born then and you were extremely old. The Living Bible says, but of course you know all this. You were alive then. The NIV says, surely you know this, for you were already alive. Very different picture from the King James Version of this. But of course you know all this. You were born then. And the Living Bible's classic, listen, But of course you know all this. You were born then, and you are extremely old, Job. (laughs) Let me tell you, you're extremely old. Because you were there then. You didn't come into existence when you were conceived. You had the privilege of coming to this planet Earth. Not everybody gets that privilege. You did. And the the most wonderful thing at all. You got to come here in this generation, the greatest generation, all generations on the face of the earth. Incredible. You're alive in this generation. You could be born in the dark ages, you know. I tell you, oh. Hallelujah. Job wanting to die. You know, you too were sent from the presence of God for a high and noble calling. When God awakened this in Job, that turned his captivity. People say it was praying for his three friends. Now, when he, worked, when he, when he prayed for his three friends, but this understanding, this recall of memory that God awakened within him turned his whole captivity around. He said, yeah, that's right, Lord, I remember. I agreed to come. Yeah, we planned this. Yeah, we planned my conditions would be hard enough. And I would be an example. We planned all. I remember, Lord, now, I remember. And he said to his three friends, it's okay, it's okay. I know what this is all about. Let me pray for you. And God turned the captivity, you see, of Job. You know, these truths should fill you with awe. This is this generation. And God is unfolding to us. You know, Jesus was chosen, the first of many, 
in the fullness of time, he said, Jesus came in the fullness of time to this earth. And his sons have been chosen in the fullness of time to come to this earth now. And we need to kind of, this destiny needs to take hold of us. It needs to come home to us. It needs to fill us with awe, you know. This world is not your home. We are aliens here. It's not your home. You know, every now and then, God lets one of us visit home. And catch up. It's what it's like. It's what it's about, you know. And uh, now, not everyone that comes here fulfills their mission. That's a different story. We won't get into that tonight or we'll be here for three weeks. But, uh, you know, oh, I tell you. You are a people of destiny. Now, don't tell me when it gets hard. Why did this happen to me? Because you agreed to come and you agreed to the conditions that would be necessary for you to fulfill your destiny and purpose on this earth. Some were born in a palace as kings because that was necessary to fulfill their destiny. Some were born into poor families. Some were born into rich families. Some came and agreed to come in handicapped children and disabled as disabled children. They agreed. You say, oh well, the devil did this. Yeah, he does all that. But God has a way of using everything and turning it to glory. I asked the Lord about this. I said, Lord, you know, I wouldn't do that. Would you? Some people can't move, can't speak. Can't. Where are they? I wouldn't agree to come for that. I don't think so, anyway. But the conditions for their destiny on this earth had to be, it's necessary. They have a secret life. Most of the time they're not there. They're on missions all over this planet. And their spirit is free. Different perspective. A lot of these in the end times and the days that lie ahead are going to be completely restored. That's how I fulfill my mission. Hallelujah completely restored oh hallelujah <laughs> whom he did foreknow he did predestinate the Bible tells us you know whom he did foreknow Romans 8 29 he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the first of many just like him okay you know, we don't talk about predestination. I've had, oh, well, it was predestined, that's it, it's all going to happen, it's all going to work out because it, it's predestination. No, 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 no. You are where you are tonight by reasons of choices you made. But God knew the choices that you had made before you made them. He saw down through time. He has foreknowledge. He said, oh, this guy's doing well, look at that makes all the right choices, this, this, this. He's, he's a candidate, I will foreordain that you are destined for this. According to his foreknowledge, he predestined you. He knew the decisions, he knew the kind of person you would be. He knew how you would respond. He knew all of these things. According to his foreknowledge, he did also predestinate you. Romans 8.30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Your predestination happened in heaven before you came. Your calling happens here on the earth. Whom he predestinated, them he called. Oh. And those he called, he justified. And listen, and whom he justified, he glorified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Having predestinated us according to the adoption of children. That word children, bad translation. It's the word for fully matured sons. But by Jesus Christ, by himself, according to his pleasure and goodwill. 
in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Whoa. Something just opened then. Whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after his own counsel and will. You see, when, you're, when you decided, yes, you accepted your mission, everything for your mission was set aside for you. Everything for you to fulfill it. Finance, giftings, kind of person you'd be, even the natural gifts you would have, was all decided before you came. And that inheritance was set aside for you. It's not issued to you all at once. You know, otherwise we wouldn't be in the danger of squandering it. But you see, like the prodigal son, you know, but when I spoke that heaven's open, there is provision going to be released tonight for destiny. You know? And uh, there is a purpose. You see, you've been sent into this world. God foreknew. We need to understand that. You see? Every human being on this planet has a destiny within. When I saw that angel the other night and he spoke to me and I looked at him, and I knew he was specific for the United States. And I have a feeling he's been before in the early, early formation of this nation, you know? And there's some kind of messenger of the Union, messenger of something. I can't get it yet, but I will. But this angel has been around a long time, but now he's back. And when I watched him, he changed into, into diamonds. He changed into... He was made up of all of these colored stones. Emeralds, sapphires, some things were gold. And he, I mean, it had all fit together. And he looked at me and I said, what? You know, it's amazing how they can change like that. But I, I, I looked at him and he looked at me and knew I was puzzled. And he said, you know, each one of these stones represents a destiny. And he said, I have been releasing stones into this earth as a sign that I am about to release destiny into my people. It's interesting that some stones, like whatever they are, those stones have been appearing. Destiny. And when you open your heart tonight, and this angel wants to, to, to release and, and, and bring out, begin to unfold your destiny and begin to, to awaken that destiny within you. Those stones, the, 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 you're going to be given a measure of what you need at this point to fulfill it. If it's finance, it will be given. If it's giftings, it will be given. Whatever you need to fulfill your destiny in measure tonight will be released to you because it's... It, it's, it's, it's petition that slowly but you know you don't get it all at once but there's a good large portion coming tonight that angel's not here just for fun you know and uh, he is standing listening to me tonight and I had a good talk to him before I came to the service tonight and uh, yeah, I didn't want to dishonor him in any way and I, I didn't want to get in his way and uh, we, we had a good talk but he is ready he is ready Hallelujah. Oh, there's a purpose for you being sent to this earth. The prime purpose is that you be conformed to the image of Jesus. The secondary purpose is your ministry in the world. You see, the Lord is pouring out His Spirit of grace on the earth in a way that has never been done before. And the, the reason of it purpose of it is to awaken destiny in people. There has never been a time like this. It's going to awaken destiny in countless thousands of people. And I tell you, as the Spirit of God sweeps across the earth, multitudes are just are going to awaken out of the kind of stupor that has is, that is kept them unaware of who they were and why they are here. It's going to start to awaken. 
young people are going to start dreaming dreams and seeing visions and hearing what they agreed to before they came here. And it's going to fire them up. Oh, hallelujah. The awakening of destiny is one of the major purposes in these last days. It's been reserved for this hour. In a time when the world is increasing in hopelessness, God's going to reveal himself like never before. And destiny, you know, is going to spring forth like a river. It's just going to flow. They will dream dreams and remember who they are, why they came, where they came from. God's going to unveil it to them. Oh, this generation must know their destiny. There's a new awakening coming. Hallelujah. See, with Job, it was like the awakening of a long-lost dream, a long-lost remembering of his history that went back thousands of years. And when God began to awaken that in him, Waking it. You know, sometimes what we call revelation is God causing us to remember. You know, we remember. You're here on this planet. This awakening is necessary now. God's about to do a quick work. Believe me, and he's going to do it. And these will, people will stand fearless with the knowledge and purpose and destiny knowing who they are or why they're here, and this is going to give them strength for the final battle. Who has saved us, you see, and called us with a holy calling which was given to us before the world began. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know whether I should say this or not. Yes. <laughs> you don't get the flack. My two little grandchildren, before my grandchildren were born, this little girl kept coming to my wife, just a little girl, and she kept saying, oh man, she come to her in her dreams, come to her when she's awake, and she kept saying to me, and I said, look, you know, I I, I think, you know, uh, our daughter-in-law is going to get pregnant, you know, she's just checking out the family. (laughs) <laughs> I tell you when this little girl was born it was identical then these two little kids are talking don't know I'm there the inter- you listen to your kids when they're talking talking there and he was saying one was saying can you remember can you remember before we came here what the color of the trees they're so different to the color of the trees that were here and I said, what? They took, like, and they were chatting away, chatting away about all of this stuff. What heaven was like, and, and all of that. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I didn't interrupt them, so I let them go. A few months went by, and I heard the oldest one, the boy, the boy was saying, he was saying, look, can you tell me again? I am forgetting, I can't remember. To his little sister. And I thought, oh yeah. And then I heard them again. And they were arguing about something, I can't remember what, and then it went quiet. And the little one said, she said, don't you remember that we agreed that you would come first? Ripley's, believe it or not. (laughs) But I'm telling you, it's true. You were alive then. Hallelujah. Something's going down, you know. One of the things that God is doing, he's beginning to now bring the apostolic in many places together. Uh, he, he's beginning to position people. You know, the, the prophetic have had a good run, but now that there's an apostolic thing coming. 
and uh, we've got to watch, wait for that and watch for that, you know, to begin to arise. You know, have you ever wondered why in the Old Testament, some of these people in the Old Testament were fanatical about where they would be buried? I mean, these guys were crazy about it. I mean, Joseph was even embalmed because he was in Egypt and he was fiddly in New Egypt and he said he made them swear. You know when a Jewish person swears on it, they've got to do it. He made them swear that they would embalm him and carry him all the way with them into the promised land. Now we're talking, you know, a lot of years. So he had to be embalmed, a lot of years. But they carried his bones all that way. Abraham was the same. Others were the same. Why was that? What did they know? You see, that others didn't know. Why was that so important to some of them? Not all of them, but to some of them. What did Joseph know? You see, what did Abraham know? I mean, you know, and it tells us in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, it said that Joseph insisted on the carrying of his bones up in Jerusalem, and it was counted to him as an act of faith. You know, as an act of faith, you must be believing for something. As an act of faith. I mean, they could have buried him in Egypt. He's, you know, really wouldn't have made that much difference, would it? See? But he said it was an act of faith. They saw something that was coming. And Jesus said of Abraham in John chapter 8, he rejoiced to see my day. He saw down the line something that was going to happen, something that was going to start going down, and he saw it down the way, and he positioned himself, and so did the others, to be a part of it. Now, it's kind of interesting, you know, it's like, what happened? Jesus died on the cross, what has happened in the city of Jerusalem? The graves were open. Only in Jerusalem. And they walked the streets of Jerusalem for days. You know? They were walking the streets. And one guy could come up and say, Hi, I'm seeing you around. He said, no. I'm Abraham. I'm Joseph. They were the first fruits of the resurrection. They saw something and they positioned themselves to be a part of it as an act of faith. Now listen to me. Are you seeing something coming? You've got to position yourself. You have to position yourself to be a part of it. It's got to be an act of faith. I want to tell you, when this harvest starts to hit in earnest, I tell you, boy, we better be ready. We better be ready for it, because it will be nothing like we've ever seen before. And it will wreck the church. Hallelujah. <laughs> it will wreck it. You won't know what to do with it. Most churches could not handle an influx of 200 people, never mind 2,000, overnight. You imagine the glory of God comes in the church and I mean the, it's resident there it doesn't leave the glory of the Lord it's just there the presence of God the power of God miracles are happening the world will be the, be the path to your door what are you going to do with them all? That's the, that's the army that first harvest is only the first that's the smallest you've got to train them they're the ones you train for the next harvest being in the next harvest, which is a huge harvest. Nothing like it. And, you know, and that's like I said the other night, you know, it's coming up to 7 billion people on the planet, and God's going to scoop the pool at a population of 7 billion people who are on the planet. He knows what he's doing. For this hour, it's, he's waited. Hallelujah. Oh. This is your day. You can waste your life or you can fulfill it 
you can find a destiny. And you're not too young and you're not too old. Some kids as young as 9, 10, and 11 are going to understand their destiny and start to walk in it. God's going to pour out his spirit on Paul all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. See dreams. They're going to remember why they are here. Where they came from. What their mission is. And they'll be willing to die for it. We've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Oh, hallelujah. Destiny. Destiny. You know, Jesus sent 70 people. Somebody many remember he sent the 70 out? And, uh, you know, you think, whatever happened to all of them? That's 70, you know? Well, the New Testament speaks of them, 30 of them at least by name. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus appointed 70 and said, go preach the gospel for the kingdom. These guys fired up in their destiny went out. You know, you remember Ananias, the guy who, who prayed for Paul's sight? He was one of the 70. Became bishop of Damascus with an incredible miracle ministry. Uh, Barnabas. You remember Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 verse 36? He brought all and laid it down at the apostles' feet. Gave everything. What happened to that guy? You see? Became bishop of Milan in northern Italy. Brought countless thousands to the Lord fulfilled the destiny the guy by the name of Aristopolis in Romans chapter 16 and verse 10 speaks of Aristopolis and uh, he took the gospel all the way to Britain oh these guys just gave their lives you know they fulfilled their destiny Thomas walked all the way to India I mean he walked all the way I've seen his grave in India you know he was martyred in India They went across the world and filled their destinies. Men and women of conviction. You know? But now it's your turn. It's my turn. It's your turn. This is our day. We were born for this. We were the privileged ones who came here in this time. And the whole of, you know, the whole a cloud of witnesses looking on, saying, these are the ones. This is the last one. These are the ones who were privileged to come. These are the ones. And you have no idea the respect that is given to Christians in the army of the Lord in the last days. They're highly honored in heaven. The last battle. Oh, hallelujah. You know, You've got to define. Once you know your destiny, you've got to define it. Define your purpose. Begin to prepare for it. Gather the necessary resources to help you fulfill it. You know, and stay focused on it. Most Christians are taken captive by the tyranny of the temporary. They don't see the big picture and they don't plan for it. They cannot break out of being caught up with the temporal things. Hallelujah. Eternity is a long time, you know. And you get one shot at this. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The call of God, you see. Shifting to the people now. Shifting to the people. We've always kept some things exclusive, right? The church has been... The hierarchy of the church is that way. Some things, you know. It says like the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers, it says the, they denied, the key, they kept them back from the key of knowledge, the Bible tells us. And uh, it kept them back. And the key of knowledge was revelation. They wouldn't let them enter in and wouldn't enter in themselves. You know? The Pharisees were like that. The Sadducees were like that. You know, Sadducees, and they had their doctrine wrong, you know, as well. 
but still wouldn't, you know, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> the call, the call of God. Oh, hallelujah. Preparation. The inward preparation is so necessary. You know, you can shout all you like, but the inward preparation is necessary. Peter said this in First Peter 1, 4, And beside giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and virtue knowledge, and add knowledge, temperance to knowledge, patience, godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in your walk with God. He doesn't have gifts. It's in what's in here. Virtue, you see? Purity, moral, spiritual, purity, knowledge, revelation, understanding, study, you see? Temperance, self-control. You see, God cannot give you authority if you don't have self-control. Because you'll use it and destroy people. You'll just get angry once and that's it. Lose it, you know. Patience. Oh, that's a hard bit, learning to wait. Godliness. That's character, you know. That's who you are. What kind of a person are you? Godliness. Are you kind? Are you gentle? Are you long-suffering with people? What kind of nature do you have? These are the qualities of the Lord. He says, these are the things that are going to qualify us, you know? Kindness. The Bible speaks about the law of kindness. I've never ever heard anyone preach on that. It is a law. And the results of that are phenomenal. You show a little kindness to people, they'll just open their heart. The law of kindness opens up people, you see. Who we are. What kind of person are you? Do you lose it? Are you moody? Up one minute, down the next? You know? You imagine giving somebody an automatic weapon and he's moody. <laughs> and he loses it. It's a scary thing. God's scary to God, too. So you know. Oh. I tell you, seraphims are coming. But I tell you, let draw this in tonight, you know. God wants the offering of our lives. He wants the laying down of our lives. He wants the laying down of our agendas, you know really, really is. And God tests us on these things. You know, it's like God does. I was telling him in Albuquerque, you know, I made a consecration to the Lord and said, Lord, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. Hallelujah. Wonderful. You know, it's easy to say that. <laughs> Lord, I'm yours. Anyway, anything you do. But, but my poor old wife was listening to this and thinking, oh yeah, I wonder what we're getting into now. A few weeks later, <laughs> Lord said to me, I want you to go to Pakistan. I said, oh, I really wasn't on the agenda, Lord. We killed people in Pakistan, you know. And this was, in the, the, this was in the 80s, and the law in Pakistan was that if anybody witnessed to you, the penalty was death. And the person could kill you on the spot. And that was the law. And they all carry guns. And God said, you go to Pakistan. I said, he's testing my heart. Testing my heart. So I said, I don't know anyone in Pakistan. Smart, you know. I don't have any contacts in Pakistan. Don't know anybody. Nobody knows me out there. A few weeks later, I get a letter from Pakistan. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Will you come and do a crusade in Pakistan? I said, God, they kill people there for that. 
Yeah. I went. Wild place. I mean, wild. We're up on the frontier with Afghanistan. I mean, wild place. And we had this little, little compound, high walls, so nobody could see in. A few believers, you know. And I said, well, this is my crusade. I'll preach. Preach to these people. Pray for the sick. A few sick got healed. A few people or more came in, and it was all sick people. You know, all sick. Prayed for them. Prayed for them. The, the numbers grew till the compound was full. And I thought, you know, this is going to get out. There is a, a white man in there converting Muslims to the Lord. That is the death penalty. Oh, uh, my goodness. You know. And it started, you know. And there was one particular miracle that God did. I prayed for this girl who was blind. She had no eyes. Uh, uh, no eyes in a socket. No eyes. Prayed for her, nothing happened. Prayed for her, nothing happened. You know, and I got, oh, we prayed for this girl. And I said to the Lord, and then uh, on the last, we were going to move to another city. And the last night, uh, that girl was waiting for me at the end. She was about 19. My mother was with her. And I said, Lord, you've got to do something. She's never going to let me go. And so I went down this and I prayed, got a hold of her. And I said, Lord, just simply, Lord, this girl has been faithful all week. She's come. You sent me here. I've told them who you are and that you're the healer. Now this girl needs eyes. I just took hold of her hands and I just prayed, Lord, give her eyes. And I still had my eyes closed. And she screamed. She gave me the fright of my life. <laughs> you know, and I went, Lord. She had eyes. First time in her life. The problem was, I looked at this girl, and she had blue eyes. And I said, God, you've got the color wrong. <laughs> I did. She's Pakistani. I do not have blue eyes. And I said, Lord, shall I pray for her again? And the Lord said, listen, everybody, going to, everybody is going to ask her why she, how she comes she's got blue eyes. There you go. You know, we went to another town and those meetings escalated to 20,000 in a, in a football stadium. Miracles I mean, it wasn't me. I'm not a healing evangelist, you know. You know that. I'm, I teach and do things. And, you know. <laughs> I'm not a healing evangelist. I mean, blind people, people with leprosy, which not just healing the leprosy, but the ear had gone, the nose had been eaten away, completely restored. And it was like... And then the Lord said to me, on the last night, close the meeting early and leave, go straight to the airport and fly to Karachi. And I said, Lord, this is fantastic. It's got, this is going to increase now. You know, I mean, I'm on a roll now. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. And I said, okay, Lord. And I said the pastor, and they were really disappointed. And I said, look, we've got to close it. The Lord told me we've got to close early. And we've got to go tonight. Lord said, there'll be a plane at the airport. We can catch it to Karachi. And so they said reluctantly, okay. As we were getting in that plane, the army trucks were rolling into the stadium to get me. <laughs> By the time I realized I was in Karachi, I never left that airport. I got the first plane to Singapore. <laughs> I tell you. And I said, Lord, what was all that about? He said, you know, you said you'd do anything for me. See, it was a test. But he said, more than that, he said, you've had a taste of what is to come. He said, except I will increase it sevenfold. The healing revival that is coming, you have no idea. There are going to be places in the earth physical, geographic places and anything, anybody walks on that property anywhere, big acreages, they will be healed. The Catholics have had it long enough. You know, Lourdes and all of these places, 
God's going to demonstrate the real thing to the world. Peter's shadow, you know, we're talking about it this morning. Stephen was talking about it this morning. We're going to see that shadow.